please be with us to open our hearts to your word, to soften us to the saving grace of Jesus. Amen. Americans love a great parade, don't they? We sure do. You familiar with ticker tape parades? Ticker tape parades started in New York in 1866. They were used for triumphant events. When, for example, Charles Lindbergh, when he made the transatlantic flight, the first airplane to cross the ocean, when he came home, he received a hero's welcome. The biggest ticker tape parade in New York was in 1962 with John Glenn, the first astronaut to be able to orbit the Earth in a spaceship. When he came back, they had a ticker tape parade. There was over 9 million pounds of confetti used for his parade. 9 million pounds. We love a hero's welcome, don't we? Heroes, they make us think of this future, of something else, something that we don't have right now. Take a look at the current elections, you know, all of the election um, meetings going on, all of those people cheering in huge venues. Isn't that like they're cheering for their hero? And I'm not, by the way, I'm not taking political sides here. Can you tell? Each one is cheering that their hero be triumphant, that they overcome the enemy of the other side. But the people who are cheering for those heroes, do they really know the history of that particular leader? Does that leader truly have any credibility? Do they know the character or nature of who they're cheering? Now, I want you to go back, take all of that, ticker tape parades, elections, all of that, and go back with me now, almost 2,000 years. It's Jerusalem. It is the Feast of the Passover, Festival of the Pas Fastover, Passover. This is the time when all of Jerusalem celebrated God's gracious, merciful love of bringing the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt. And there was a huge celebration. Now, normally Jerusalem was a town of about 50,000 people. But some historians say it would have doubled in size to 100,000. There's an ancient historian, his name's Josephus. He said that it got up to two and a half million people in Jerusalem. That seems to be a bit of an exaggeration. But you have to know that this was a huge celebration. And in comes Jesus into Jerusalem. And all of the people are cheering. They're saying, Hosanna. They are saying, save us. Now, if you were in the crowd, and if you were waving the palms as they were doing, if you were waving the palms, do you know who you'd be cheering? Do you know his history? Do you know his credibility? Do you know his nature? Do you know the king? And that's the question. Do you know the king? And is he your king? So let's take a look at his history. Now if you take a look at the life of Jesus, he doesn't come from a family of much means. I mean, his father was a carpenter. They lived in this tiny little village, very small. And so if you take a look at him, and Jesus, as far as we know, he didn't go to school. He was uneducated. So historians take a look at him and they say, Messiah? I don't think so. So a lot of people dismiss Jesus because of his family. But if you take a look at not just his family, but the entire breadth of history of which he is part, you find something much more interesting. See, you find the history of God fulfilling his promises in and through Jesus. The past five months, we've been really taking a look at the promises of Jesus. We've gone to the Garden of Eden, where God gave his promise right there in the garden. 
Then we went through the Old Testament. We looked at Isaiah. We looked at Jeremiah. God keeping His promises for thousands of years. And then we see in Jesus Himself. What's His history? Well, from all of those promises, we see that He was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see that he came from the house of King David. We find out that he was born of a virgin. That his name is called Emmanuel, God with us. We find out a lot of promises that are fulfilled throughout his history. And now at this point in our text, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the, to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. See all those promises I was talking about? This is another one, his history. This refers to the prophet Zechariah who lived 500 years before Jesus. 500 years. And by the way, Zechariah's name means Yahweh remembers. Yahweh is God's sacred name. So it's God remembering. This wasn't a random thing that Jesus said. This was planned and ordained 500 years before he was born. Because God remembered, God heard the cries of the people in pain. The people who were in slavery. The people who needed a Savior, God remembered. This was not a random saying that Jesus did. This was a fulfilled prophecy. Let me give you an idea of how this is fulfilled and how special and impeccable the history of Jesus is. There's a professor. His name is Peter Stoner, I believe. Yes, uh, Peter Stoner. And he is a professor of mathematics, statistician. He decided to say, what's the probability of Jesus fulfilling miracles? And so he took 12 of his classes, which meant 600 students. And he said, all right, students, Here are the prophecies of Jesus. I want you to work in groups, and I want you to be as conservative as possible. Talk about, could this prophecy actually be a conspiracy, yes or no? Whittle them all down until you can come to an agreement. Now, how many of you have agreed fully with with just another person? Like, right? Husband's wife, agreeing fully. It's a miracle! No, I'm just kidding. But now, get 600 people to agree on something. He got 600 students to agree on a very conservative estimate of these miracles. Then he said, I'm going to take that even further. I'm going to whittle it down. He's focused on just eight miracles. He had his results validated by a scientific community. The probability of Jesus fulfilling just eight miracles is 10 to the 17th power, which means you get 10 with 17 zeros after it. Now that's hard to comprehend, so let me give you an idea. Let's say you took a silver dollar, and you took enough silver dollars for 10 to the 17th, which means you could fill the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep. You got that in your mind? State of Texas, silver dollars, two feet deep. Now, I'm going to put one little dot on one side of one silver dollar. I'm going to throw it into that mix. Now, I'm going to take one of you blindfolded. And you've got to go through the state of Texas, and you only get one chance to pick out that one silver dollar with the dot on. That is the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight prophecies, but there were over 300 prophecies. If you did even 48 prophecies, by the way, you'd have to fill the state of Texas 
26 feet high with all those silver coins with only one on a dot. That is the history of Jesus. Professor Stoner said this. He said, any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. That's his history. What about his credibility? Let's go to the text. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now we could talk more about his lineage. We could talk more about the history. But let's just focus on what the crowd did. So the crowd cut palm branches. <laughs> Who's been to a Twins game? Um, okay, not many Twins fans. All right, well. Do you ever do a Homer Hankey thing? You've seen Homer Hankeys, right? You've waved Homer Hankeys? They didn't have Homer, ha Homer Hankeys. They had palm branches. But palm branches were much more significant than a Homer Hankey. See, the palm branch was found on the coins in Judea. And the palm branch was a symbol of the nation. It talked about the value and wealth of a nation. So, they, so when Jesus came into Jerusalem, it would have been spring, they cut the palm branches and they laid them on the road before them. They laid before Jesus something of great value. But it's even more than that. Palm branches were also of necessity. They were considered a gift from God because they gave so many things to the people. So the people laid on the road before Jesus something of value and of necessity. So not only that, they shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. This must be understood as a great exaltation and honor. Hosanna literally means save us. So they are saying, save us. You, Jesus, the son of the great King David, save us. So being known as part of the lineage of David, by the way, was not new to Jesus or his followers. Before he was born, the angel of the Lord came to Mary and said to her, He will be great, and he will become called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then the crowd shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When you come in the name of the Lord or the, in the name of anyone, you ca come representing them. We don't have that a whole lot in our life nowadays. But think about an ambas ambassador at a national level. An ambassador comes in the name of the ruler of that nation. Jesus came with the full authority as God. Not only that, he spoke as God because they called him the prophet. See, a prophet was one who spoke the very words of God. In the Gospel of John, this is what Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And then they said, Hosanna in the highest. This is saying like the highest heaven. Blessed is he from the highest heaven, the one who is with God himself. 
So all of them, even the angels, were proclaiming to Jesus, Hosanna in the highest. Now listen, with that background to his credibility to what the crowd said. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You have to understand the richness of who he is. His credentials as a king. Could anybody else pass that test? So we've taken a look at his history. We've taken a look at his credentials. But here's the question. Now that you know about him, do you know him? See, a lot of people know about Jesus. But do you know him? Do you know his nature? It says in our scripture reading today, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. See, the people were expecting a conquering hero. They were expecting the Messiah to come in to Jerusalem, to come into their lives, to wipe out their enemy, to wipe out Rome. That's who they were expecting. But that is not his nature. You know, first of all, he didn't look like a hero. You know, in Hollywood, all the movies about Jesus, I'm going to guess that Jesus himself would not be able to be cast in a movie about him because he didn't look like a hero. It says this in Isaiah, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. In fact, this humble king was esteemed by few at all. Most rejected him. See, in their mind, they wanted that hero to come in. And by the way, that leader, that hero coming into battle would normally be riding this wonderful, majestic steed, a horse of war. But what did Jesus come in on? A donkey. They weren't expecting that at all. You see, Jesus came in not to wage war against the earthly oppressors. He came to fight a much greater battle. He came to fight and overcome Satan, sin, and death itself. This was a battle that no one else could overcome. It says this, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He accomplished what no one has ever or will ever accomplish. And he did not do it through the sword. He did it by submitting. He did it in a way that no one expected. In our reading from Philippians, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Other kings gain power from their people. This king gave up everything so his people would be freed. He gave up his body. He shed his blood on the cross so that you could be free from sin. 
This is the Redeemer King. This is His nature. Through His death on the cross, He brought a peace. In Isaiah, it says He's the Prince of Peace. And what peace did He bring? He bought, brought forgiveness of sin. Anytime there's sin before God, there's a broken relationship through the cross of Christ. He restored us. That's the gospel message. But very few people understood this. You had people waving palms and everything. They wanted a political leader. They wanted a social worker who would feed the masses. They wanted a physician who would heal the sick. But did they want a Savior in which there was forgiveness of sin? Did they want just a temporary solution to earthly problems? Or did they want eternal salvation? People didn't know him. That's why in the Gospel of Luke, it talks about when he went up to the gates of Jerusalem, before he entered the city, Jesus cried. He wept. And this is what he said. And when he drew near the city and drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day that the things made for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. This is the king. This is his nature. Do you know the king? You see, think about, again, going back to today, about the election, all the election rallies that are occurring, people clamoring. They think they're electing a savior, but they're not. People think they can elect Jesus too, but you can't elect Jesus. He has always been the king. The only thing you can redo, the only thing you can do is receive him as king. There is no comparison with anyone else in history or ever has been. The question before you today is do you know the king? Is he your king? Is he your Lord? And Savior, the one who died for you for forgiveness of sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son Jesus, who on the cross died for us. Let us all open our hearts and receive him as our King. Amen.